You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 94, to prep or not to prep. In this episode, it's composite veneers versus porcelain veneers, which is better and for which situations. And also, are we going back in time with our material choices with veneers or is what is out there now the best? We'll give it to you straight this week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. Do you want to be able to understand, place, restore, and implement dental implants into your practice? Well, we've got the course for you, Restorative Driven Implants, taught by the Dental Guys. Restorative Driven Implants is coming to Des Moines, Iowa this fall 2019. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com right now to sign up for the next series. Well, welcome. To this week's episode of The Dental Guys, I'm John The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes The Dental Guy. And you know, every time before the show, we kind of wait to talk about what is the monologue or what's the beginning segment of the show going to be. And you know, most times it's dental related in some way, but I mean, sometimes it's just well, off the cuff. We've talked about a lot of different things, John. We have. We talked about bees. That's probably one of the most memorable. And it's bee tasting. tonight, Wes, is, he's like, without question. Without question, I know what we're talking about. We're talking about cold brew coffee and emulsifiers. Well, let me. Just I was like, hold, hold on, don't say anything else. Let's roll this beautiful bean footage and start the show. So, all right, Wes, I'm, we're all ears, man. What do you What do you want to talk about? So, did they change your life? Emulsifiers. Yeah, well, emulsifiers have changed my life recently, <laughs> and I'm really. I haven't. I want to study the chemistry behind this because it is amazing. Okay. Okay. So how You're does that really to do with, sell me on this? Well, how does it have to do with cold brew coffee? Now, now, John, you know, during the summertime, it's cold brew season at yeah. the Mullins house, and it yeah. starts out with someone giving you free coffee. All okay. the time, somebody's giving me free coffee at the office. Well, yeah, obviously they know what you're all about. So somebody bought me some free coffee, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to toddy this up. So toddy. Is an immersion mm. way to to make cold coffee. It's how Starbucks does it, and uh, I have a toddy. So I twenty four hour cold brew some Brazilian roast uh, mm. over the weekend, and um, man, it's super tasty, super sweet. Um, and so I said, you know what? I was watching a. Uh, if you haven't checked out this YouTube channel, it's called Binging with Babish, and okay. it's a it's a food um, show on YouTube. And it's really simple, straight to the point. He's he's got a lot of followers, almost five million um, um, subscribers. Hmm. And he did something uh, on frappuccinos. <clears throat> and as I was watching him talk about like blending the ice, the coffee, and the milk is what's the basis of a frappuccino. The I and you know he talked about making iced coffee, and I was like, you know, what? I'm gonna go do this. Okay. Okay. But what it, what happens when you do ice, coffee, and milk in a Vitamix is the Vitamix does an amazing job blending it. But as yeah. it sets, yeah, okay, it separates, and okay. it's not fun to drink a frappuccino, okay, when it separates because you get the ice, you get water, it yeah, just doesn't it doesn't, doesn't work, come does together, <clears throat> right? Yeah. So, so what has changed this? Emulsifiers? <laughs> Is that where emulsifiers come in? Emulsification. <laughs> emulsification, John. <laughs> so what do you, changed what is, my life. So, so what I, do you put in there? Do you buy zip, like a bottle that says emulsifier no, on it? You buy bacteria exoskeletons. Oh. Xanthan. <laughs> Xanthan gum. What? Back, <laughs> did you just say bacterial exoskeletons? Yes. <laughs> That's I mean, we should just end the show right there. And it's interesting you said done. roll that beautiful bean footage because uh, <laughs> oh, my wife said that there's another one because xanthan gum is grown in um, like a corn uh, media. 
And so okay. she's allergic to corn, and she says, you know, sometimes I think maybe if I eat a lot of xanthan gum, which is an emulsifier, which yeah. brings all those things, three unlike materials, it blends them together, and from top to bottom, when you drink your cold brew frappuccino, it stays together amazing. It is amazing science, okay? So what was the be- bean thing, Laura? What's it? Guar, okay? Guar, Guar I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. is an emulsifier, and it... And it binds things together. So think of this, okay? Here we go. And this we're done for the geeky monologue <laughs> okay, science here. Right. Okay, think of whenever you have like an oil and vinegar mixture, okay? Yeah. So how they bind those things, because if you shake up oil and vinegar, it only stays bound for like a second or two. Right, right, right. So when you do yeah. an emulsion, okay, with an emulsifier, okay. okay, and we're talking about a tiny, tiny bit. Okay. okay, like like minuscule amount. It blends it together, ties it together into an emulsion, and it's amazing. It's amazing. So science. this it's has food changed science. your cold brew coffee. Well, experience. I just had, I just had a frappuccino. You know, is it I'm, true? Isn't it true that cold brew coffee has three times the caffeine? Oh yeah, and it's because it's concentrated. Right, because you got to use a lot more grounds to get the same. Yeah, I use coffee. a pound of grounds, but typically I dilute it. You so know? that's why you're like hopped a, up right now, dude. Because you just had like 500 milligrams of caffeine in one in like <laughs> one cup, and you're like bacterial kinda, exoskeletons. I mean, I've worked ten hours Zentan today, gum. and I'm like <laughs> kicking right now, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey. before we get into the show, yeah, this has been it. an exciting monologue where you've learned something about emulsification, and we mm. know. That if, that, if, if you enjoyed that, if you have not turned the show off yet, you're going to love what's coming up next. We're going to be talking about veneers. We're going to talk mm. about composite versus porcelain veneers, prepless versus prep veneers. Mm. What type of materials should you be looking at for those types of veneer cases? So right after this break, right after this word from our sponsor, come back. We're going to talk about some cool stuff. This is Justin Goodbrand. and here is today's tip. If you have a 401k plan, it's now time to file your 5500 form. The 5500 is basically a document recording the details of your 401k from the previous year. If you miss this filing deadline, you will face penalties. Also, now's the time to revisit the 401k design to determine if you need to make a plan year adjustment. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. All right, so we're back. And uh, man, this is this is a, a show that we've kind of been talking about over the years, really, Wes, because you know, I remember the first time <clears throat> you and I really got together and, and really talked about this was when we went to Jason Smithson's course together a few mm-hmm. years back. And hey, it was we cheap went the good CE too, right? Yeah, cheap but good, incredibly good CE. Here yeah, he thanks. was in a, a room with, you know, I don't know, 25, 30 dentists mm-hmm. here, and the AGD brought him in. Uh, mm-hmm. Great, great get by the Tennessee AGD. And he's talking about how to do really good composite veneers, among mm-hmm. other things. And um, so it really got us thinking about that because I, I, I don't know about you, Wes, but I, I want to tell you my, <clears throat> my experience with composite veneers. And I want to know what you think about them and kind of how you use them. I want to talk about that first before we get into porcelain. Um, I think that composite veneers, no one is good at them when they start. You know, I, I think that that you <laughs> just you come know right out and say it, man. Yeah, they're just not. I mean, you 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 get you like get this great composite, you know, that has this little shade wheel, and you turn the little wheel, and you're like, okay, if I want to make an A one, I got to use this body shade and this enamel shade and this blah blah blah, and you try to like have a cookbook because don't we want that? We talk about this all the time <clears throat> on the show that dentists we want kind of like an instruction manual. Just tell me what to do. Tell me what to do, and I will do it, and I'll get a result. A problem with composite veneers is that that is not enough. There's not; It's not enough to just have a cookbook. And so I think that for me, you know, I I thought I could do composite veneers when I got out of school because I was like, oh, it's just a a giant class four is kind of what I thought. 
But when you get into it and you start dealing with, you know, matrixing and you start dealing with subgingival finish lines and you start dealing with, let, let alone all the, sh I'm not even talking about the shade stuff. That That's mm -hmm. the really hard stuff. But when you just start talking about just getting it to contour correctly, there's a lot of challenges. Now we know, we're not even going to get into this today. And you know there's all kinds of systems that have been developed, such as the BioClear system, which is very good, mm -hmm. to try to deal with diastema closure, contouring, subgingival stuff. But I, I want to tell you kind of where they are. I, I've taken a lot. Of, I say that to say I've taken a lot of classes since that time. Not a, I mean, not like, you know, 20, but I've taken probably four or five half day or day long classes from people like Smithson, Corky Wilhite, these types of folks and trying to get better at it. And I think that you really even can't, I would even make the case, you can't get better at composite veneers with just repetition. I think you have to go <clears throat> to courses taught by artists and you have to see what they see and understand how the art and the science really comes together. Maybe more than anything, I would even maybe say more than anything I do. It's maybe the most artistic thing that I do. And I know that although I think I know what a pretty tooth looks like and I can identify a good looking shade match, I'm not an artist. Like that's not my core gift in terms of like my personality type. So for me, I have to understand how the art is created by like what the science does. So I got to almost have somebody else show me, here's what to do to make it look good. Anyway, so now in my practice, the problem is the more courses I took, and the better I got at this, I actually found I was taking more time, not less, to do these things. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I feel like I, I got to a point where I could do them pretty well. Not, I mean, I'm no Smithson, but I'm, I'm okay. I'm pretty good. And, but the problem was, Wes, I was spending more time for sure on composites than I would ever spend on porcelain. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I was prepping the tooth a lot like I would prep a porcelain veneer because, it, you know, so, so I want to know like, where do you, where are you with that? Where are you using composite veneers? I'll tell you where I'm using them. I'm using them typically in younger patients mm -hmm. where I'm doing additive dentistry, say like peg laterals, mm -hmm. and I don't have to do a lot of reduction or no reduction or very little. And, uh, or a patient who maybe I want to get like a transitional type of thing for final restorations. I, maybe I, maybe I'm like a bad dentist, but I just don't, I don't do them a lot because I don't feel like I can charge what I would need to charge for the time that I spend. So tell me about your journey with that. Where do, where do you use them? Like, what's your what's your thought on composite veneers? <clears throat> so my journey started in dental school, and I don't think I ever talked to you about this, but we had a guy come in the fourth year class got taught to do and it was sponsored by ultra i remember that because we got a ton of free stuff and man That's it was good. awesome talked about layering that was the first time i got exposed to uh, translucent composites and some staining <clears throat> actually using paint brushes and and just it really intrigued me but um and then just kind of got the juices flown as far as like hey you can really like have like a stained glass appearance to you know some of these things and at that point in time in early 2000 whitening whitening had really taken off and so people were they, some of the cases that he were he was showing was like man these people with dark teeth and like check lines and all this stuff he was like matching all that but then as i went through residency most people were wanting their teeth whitened and when you whiten teeth most of the time, what happens is is that you whiten white spots and you increase translucency. Right. Okay. So keep that in mind: is that anytime you whiten something, you're going to whiten the whitest areas and you're going to increase the translucency of the tooth. If you do any high quality whitening in your practice, even even just crest white strips will do that, mm -hmm. um, but not to the extent of like maybe deep bleaching or something like that. So I got exposed to it at an early time, and I did some veneer work in dental school on a gentleman where I <coughs> closed a diastema mm -hmm. between eight and nine. <clears throat> and I got jazzed up about it because it, it looked really good. And it was mm -hmm. with TPH composite. And I did some of the staining techniques that I learned in that little dent supply or that little ultra dent 
uh, lunch and learn thing, and I just got excited about it. But (laughs) the frustration was the system because I'm this guy that says do A, B, and C, and you get this result every single time. And for me, and I kind of sense that in your story there just a minute ago, is that you wanted, and it seems like we want this defined look because yes. everybody, for the most part, wants the same kind of look because we don't have these patients coming in with like shade A4, D4, and you're really, occasionally you run into that. Occasionally, right. but it's not right. somebody you're doing veneers on where right. they need that. They want this look, yep. okay? And the look that they want is the look that ceramics gives consistently. Exactly. And, and what It's happened, not a matter of can you do it with composite, but it's the consistency. You can. And so it turned out that the guy that really got me excited about composite <clears throat> veneers, he was super duper talented. There was a gentleman that was coming up to the residency and he had a big time composite veneer practice. I mean, hmm. he was like, Masters in Academy of General Dentistry, like twice or something like that, and just had taken all these courses. And but he was super duper talented. He was efficient. You know what I learned from him though, is I learned how to do good ceramic veneers mm, mm-hmm. because the amount of time that it took him to do a composite veneer, I could be doing ceramic veneers. Right. And and I felt like well. And his big deal was like the repairability of a composite. If True. a patient chips it, True. Had so, it was so advantageous and he felt so good about that composite that he could make it look so good that if a patient chipped it, it was a simple repair and low cost. So that, that kind of led to me just saying, you know what I'm going to use composite for is I'm going to use composite for patients with congenitally missing or congenital peg laterals um children that you know need minimally invasive dentistry Mm -hmm. and use you do class four composites that are good and then occasionally occasionally do like four through ten or seven through ten four Mm -hmm. anteriors um i did a seven through ten last year and i swear i spent three and a half hours on this thing yeah And I went through the exact same protocols that I would have done as far as diagnostics and workup that I did with ceramics, and I made less money. Yeah. And And, and the question is, do you really have a better product? Because that's the thing that's holding me up. I'm going, okay, definitely making less money, but, you know, okay, that's okay. I don't know. You know, better better product? I I mean. This is the thing. Is it better? That's debatable. I mean, whether it's better or not than ceramics, um, because the preps are in some ways similar. Yeah. I think Um, you can maybe get away, you know, I think maybe we need to compare apples to apples because, you know, let's define what a veneer prep is. Now, we did this back when we talked about veneers many shows ago. So if you didn't, if you haven't heard our veneer show, I think it's pretty good. I mean, we talk a lot about what we just what we've learned, and not nothing much what, changed since then. No, no, we talk about finished line design, but I think we should we should mention if you go to some places, um, we're gonna we probably shouldn't name names, <clears throat> but if you go to some places, you're gonna learn to do a very aggressive veneer preparation, right? Mm-hmm. That's gonna go into dentin, and you're gonna be you know reducing 1.5 millimeters, uh, putting a millimeter margin. Um, we don't think that, I would not call that a veneer prep. For me, that's a, a crown prep. Uh, we're talking about veneer preps that are uh, less, that are in enamel. Let's put it that way. Yeah, let's just call three tenths to a half millimeter. Yeah, yeah enamel veneers. Now, <clears throat> I would say for most composite veneers, you're going to have to do some similar prep to mm-hmm. a thin porcelain veneer. Because I used to, I, the argument used to be, West that, well, composite veneers are more conservative. Okay, well, that's true if you don't have to prep the tooth. But I would say, well, there's why wouldn't you just use a thin veneer? We're going to talk about that a little bit later in the show. It depends on how you want to create and finish your margins. You know? Yeah, that's true. So, you know, but that's the whole thing is that if, if people say that they're doing prepless mm-hmm. composite or ceramic veneers, 
Right. Okay. My biggest question is how they define where the margins are. Right. Because that finish line, it is micro thin. I mean, it is paper thin. But would you agree that a lot of times in a composite veneer, you're having to create a, a similar yeah, you have to type create of a, margin? A massive bevel. I do. Yeah. Yeah. You got to create a bevel and you have to have some type of maybe light chamfer margin just so that you have something to have, you know, rather you can't, I don't know, some people would say you can have like an infinity margin with some of these like Esalite Omega or Enamel, mm -hmm. but I think you have to have something to define your, your margin. And I would say that there's not a huge difference in terms of the thin veneer prep and the composite veneer prep in general, in general. unless you have an under contoured tooth. Which, in which case, I would, again, say the same thing. You're going to not have to prep it much for a porcelain veneer either. And I would definitely say the debate is in the material itself. Assuming that the prep is the same, Wes. Assuming that your prep is at least similar. I mean, it comes down to what you said. Repairability mm -hmm. versus strength. And that's the big thing is, you know, you've got composite, which has a little bit more flexibility, a little mm -hmm. bit more elasticity versus... Uh, your 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 porcelains, which in general are stiffer, but have less flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it's a question of what would I maybe want on my own tooth. I don't know. For me, depends on what you're trying to achieve. Well, uh, assuming we've talked, that we've talked about this on you, right? Right, right, right. We've talked about this on you because you know, with um, I'll get into specifics. If we were doing any on anybody, yeah, any edge wear case right. where we were going to enhance the incisal edge back to where it was prior to the edge wear okay mm -hmm. so we're going to add better um, embrasures incisal embrasure spaces okay so what we're saying is with composite that you're going to do a bevel on the facial a bevel on the palatal or a bevel on the lingual if you're doing the lower anteriors and a bevel on the pa and the facial you know, a long bevel. Now, when I'm talking about beveling, I'm not talking about a half a millimeter bevel. We're talking about like one of these infinite edge bevels. Right, okay? like a two, three millimeter yeah, you're bevel. Taking yeah, a, you're taking some kind of uh, a flame diamond and you're, and you're going, you know, two to maybe three millimeters, very fine, thin edge. And then you're bonding and working over top of that edge. Now, what you're saying when you do that, okay, is that with composite... You're saying you're accepting some, some, um, um, well, I don't think you're accepting any really compromise in aesthetics with something like that, because I feel like you can make that look really, yeah, that, really good. That you okay? can make, I think, look just as good. Right. But I think the issue is, is that you have to choose, I guess, the composite debate to me today really is not so much as a debate as it used to be. And here's why. All right. So press, let's get into this for just a second here. We don't do what we don't do veneering with composite because one, it takes too much time and it requires the same amount of planning and diagnosis that it does to do some of these cer ceramic veneers. And yep. to be honest with you, we're not doing it all the time, so we're probably we're not as good as maybe somebody doing it all the time. Right. Okay? I think if you had somebody on here who that was their main deal, you know, maybe that it, does change extremely things. Extremely talented individuals are probably yeah. going to be able to do it in less time than sure. we would ever be. And that's fine. But you know what? Those those are very special situations. Right. So what I'm saying for most of us out there that are that are doing protocol driven dentistry where we're like A, B, and C get you this result which is the kind of dentist that we are. And it's very difficult to apply that to composite veneers. Right. And, and, and it's, it's very it easy to apply it to porcelain. It's very easy. Okay. Because you so, just, you know that your lab technician who does right. do that all the time can but, pretty much give you the result as long as you give them an adequate prep. So the indications, I guess, let's sum this up here and then we're going to move to ceramics. The indications for composite for me, I feel like, is a little bit of that incisal edge stuff. Like, right, I think that that's a great place for it because I can make sure. it look good. I can do a little minimal wax up myself. Right, if you, you know? don't have to cover the entire facial yeah. of a tooth or you don't have changing, to close embrasure. I'm not changing facial embrasures. 
I'm yeah. not changing buckle lingual tooth position very much, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. I feel like I can achieve a polishability with the type of composites we're using today. Yeah. That's amazing. And I can get some depth because I'm using the tooth for the depth of color. So right. that's it. Maybe some peg laterals here and there on right. my Transitional stuff. Yeah. 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 Transitional bonding. And even that stuff, I don't spend a lot of time on. To be honest with right. you, because I don't want you know you're going to, to porcelain. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. And now, I think that there. So, but but there's there's a lot of re- we have to again grain of salt. If we had Jason Smithson on here or somebody of his caliber, I believe in all in all honesty that he could probably produce a result that looks just as good as a, as porcelain predictably with speed and probably makes sense from a financial standpoint and and does have that repairability. So I'd say that you know. Maybe we need to get better at it. You know, maybe maybe I need to keep getting better. I feel like I've done a lot, and I feel like I still just maybe I think the maybe average it's just practitioner listening to this can benefit yeah. from going to some courses from oh, yeah. somebody like we Huge. talked about, Corky Wheelhart, Jason Smithson, because just knowing how to do good class four composites, yeah, and knowing yeah. how to do some mock-ups. Yep, just right? knowing how to layer a composite to where just you can layer. get some predictable aesthetic results and understanding opacity and translucency. I mean, I really yeah. think that I was just looking, Gotta you go. know, he, he, he does a lot of courses and, mm-hmm. you know, one of his top courses right now is profitable composite, right? Yeah, and that's, that's what we're great, up at. It's a great it's course. It's a great title. Great it's title. It's a great title here, you know? And then yeah. he's got other things called composite artistry. Now, yeah. I'm telling you right now, the, one of the main reasons that we used composite, you know, to do veneering is because all we had was feldspathic porcelain. Right. Okay. But then when pressable ceramics came on the market Mm -hmm. and we were able to add two pressables, a little bit of cutback and put feldspathic porcelain to add depth, that... I really believe changed the game because the the feldspathic the limitations of feldpathic were one the difficulty of fabrication mm-hmm. number two the fit like to fit a feldspathic porcelain to your tooth I mean it's tough because most of the time feldspathic is minimally you know it's point one to point three typical okay. And strength is a disadvantage, okay? Right. So when people didn't want to deal with the difficult of Feldspathic, because seeding a Feldspathic veneer, if you've ever done it, John, I know you have, it is very difficult. You have yeah, to it can be really, stressful. It can be stressful. And you can break them, you know, even oh. when you do everything right. Yeah, you can and, totally uh, break them. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right, and I think I think that did change the game. Um, I think that uh, when press newer materials... Came on, it the game change the game yeah and i think that when you could get a thin material that was still strong mm-hmm. it totally changed the game so let's let's kind of for the second part second half of the show let's talk a little bit about how, if you're if you're moving from composite to porcelain you're thinking still of the mindset of enamel based veneers you know of yeah. minimal and, and the big thing that we've heard now for a long time in fact it kind of came up in the 90s <clears throat> really, in the early 2000s, was the no prep or the prepless veneer. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk about that type of veneer. What does that mean? Uh, what types of materials are we talking about? And then how does that, you know, what are the indications for that? You know, because there's there's some really good things about that type of dentistry and there's some, some real pitfalls. And I want to talk a little bit about the lab side of things because that mm-hmm. has changed a lot because you mentioned feldspathic has kind of gone out of style yeah, but because why would but, you but for these ultra thin cases you got to use it that's right for these ultra thin cases and so you know people have moved well we, let's get into that later but let's first talk about the no prep idea and i want to kind of hear your thoughts on this um where where do you feel where are you using a no prep type of approach for your veneers <laughs> It is so rare mm-hmm. to, to for me even to, I mean, the first no prep veneer case that we we did, it was a lingualized, you know, retroclined dentition mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And it was all additive. And literally, when it, I remember when we did this at Resonant, we called up Serenate, which makes the Lumineers is the mm-hmm. brand, right? And we were like, so what do we need to do? Do we need a pack cord? <laughs> I mean, like, do you need a finish line? And literally they were like, no, you just take a good high quality PVS impression and we'll have a wax up made and then we'll make the veneers. Yeah. And I'll, I'll never forget when we seated these things as residents, did they look good? Meh. They looked okay. Yeah. Were they great? No, they were op- opaque because there was thickness there that there was no, it just wasn't great. Now I'm not saying, I'm not saying. Okay, that there's no such thing as a prepless veneer. But really when we dove into it and we were learning how to use these things is that the technicians would say, you know, our best case is there's some reduction. They would say yep. that every single time. Yep. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Well, we at least like to have a little incisal edge reduction, kind of lap that edge over top so that we can develop that incisal edge color. Right, and then some kind of finish line. And then some kind of finish line because when they said just take a PVS impression, we were like come on, how do we finish this? Like, how do right. you finish that? Right. You know? Where's the cement going to go? And how do you know it's fully seated? We've all, if you've been in dentistry long enough, you know who Willie Geller is, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, a master of all things amazing when it comes to Feldspathic. Now that guy, you know, that guy can do some pretty amazing things, right? right. And I've seen some pretty amazing things with Feldspathic. But man, I just don't get it with prepless veneers. I think it was a fad because there were so many people in the 90s that were like, veneer, 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 veneer. Right. And they were like, man, we got to cut, 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 cut. And then this this new material came out. And it was like a reaction to the overprep and the fact people were having debonds from the fact they were trying to bond veneers to dentin. Yes. And I think it was like, oh, well, we'll bounce back. But they bounced back a little too far to this no prep idea. And the other thing I've seen a lot of with these cases is just severe gingival inflammation because oftentimes they're so over contoured. Over contoured margins. S- in the subgingival, and it's hard to clean the cement. And so I'm the margins are these rough. these cases and, can't look good. But when it no, comes down to it, when it comes down to it, it's a very, very far and few between yeah. have the ability, far and few patients have the ability to have. Right, and it's very veneer. technique sensitive. And, you know what's and interesting too is the marketing's changed because yeah. no one comes in asking for prepless veneers anymore. Isn't it interesting? Like I feel like what you mentioned, one of the labs, you know, Lumineers, and then of course they had like Da Vinci, yeah. and all these all these materials. And now you said, you know, you said it. People don't ask for it anymore because the marketing really not a lot of people I think are actually doing no prep veneers anymore, prepless veneers. I think that everybody realizes that. You have to do something, at least in the majority of cases, and and that something often doesn't have to be much. I mean, I, I we, but here, but here's I think what happened next. This is the interesting thing that happened next. So Emacs comes on the market, mm. right? We're we're well, gonna we're gonna skip one of my favorite materials, which is Empress, because yeah, I think I still know. think Empress is one of the best materials me, for veneers was, out there. It was amazing. Yeah, but Emacs comes on the market, and everybody goes sweet. Here's a material that has translucency, that we can mill, that we can press, but most importantly, that we can bond. And it has strength. And of course, what do dentists want? They want something that doesn't break because they don't want to have to. Right. So people started saying, well, let's make our veneers out of Emacs. And I'll I'll be completely honest. I wanted the same thing. I wanted the same thing. So I started doing some Emacs veneers. And the problem that I ran into at almost every single time was I would do a feldspathic prep and I would get back a veneer that was over contoured. So I would do a, you know, a 0.3 millimeter, 0.4, maybe 0.5 margin. Mm-hmm. And I would get back a veneer that was 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8 at the margin. And I was always seeing, not always, but often seeing over contour of the restoration. Well, it's and. And a lot of that comes from the fact that, one, so when you're waxing at point three, mm-hmm. so when you're pressing, let's just let's just back up here for just a second. Yeah. When when you press margins, okay, pressing margins is a lot easier than yeah. milling margins. Right. Milling okay? is the problem. 
I firmly Milling believe. is the issue because yeah. the minute that you ask a mill to go less than a half millimeter when the burr size and the chatter and of the, the quality of the mill or whatever it is, I don't care yeah. what kind of mill you have. Right. M- right. MCXL5, right. Roland, exactly. Zircon doesn't Zon. Matter. It doesn't matter because yeah. all of them, they have a limitation right now. And the material itself being milled has a limitation. And so what yep. happens is they have to be milled at a greater thickness than what you want them as a dentist. And so guess what? That's what the technician has to do. Hand finish, hand thin the Emacs. Yep. Now, let me just tell you right now. How Talk many of you have taken a disc and hand thinned the marginal area of a ceramic crown without chipping or nicking the margin? Right. Is it hard? I mean, if you have four and a half power scopes or six power Man. scopes, I mean, it's just difficult. your hands, just your hands, like, How, the like your hands start to time. cramp up yes. doing one, let alone having to do 10 or 12 and don't and get it right. Don't ask the lab to do this if you're paying less than $100 for your veneer. Oh, man. Yeah, no, you, should, you shouldn't expect that. And, don't and don't even pro- ask. But I will tell you, too, that even a lab that, that understands what you're going for, um, the time investment that it takes for them to mill and hand thin, what, what I found, Wes, is it's just almost impossible to get them to do it, even in, even in the best of situations. So... It's led me back to feldspathic. Now, this Man. has been something in just the last year, year and a half. Yeah, we've been talking I, about I, this. I know we've been talking about it, and I've just I've had a lot of frustration with my Emacs veneers of having to send them back. And there's you know, you want to talk about a bad day? Here, here's a bad day. <laughs> okay, you got I'm laughing a because you've already told me. <laughs> yeah. You got a high aesthetic, I mean, because every veneer case pretty much is high aesthetic demand. We all know it. Most times it's out of pocket. So you got somebody who's been in ortho for a year and a half. Years. <laughs> right, right. Five years. Oh, we need to go back to the orthodontist and need to move 0.5 apically. Exactly. So <laughs> right. I, yeah, I've been, exactly. I've been playing that game with the orthodontist for like six months, try to get the position just right because a deep bite case or something. So you're finally ready to put these veneers on. So you put them in p- composite. Then you make a matrix, then you prep the veneers, and you put them into temps, and the temps are beautiful. Because why? It's composite, it's BIS GMA, so I can go in there and thin them out and make them exactly how I want them. Mm-hmm. So I send the case to the lab, I take an impression of the provisionals, showing them the thickness that I want the tooth to be. All you gotta do is put a caliper on the tooth, Wes. Put a caliper on the tooth, and, and then measure it and make sure that the veneer is the same. So you don't really know. Now, what I've learned is always check the thickness of the veneer before you take the provisionals off. Because a bad day is taking 12 provisional veneers off, which as we talked about before, I use shrink wrap techniques. So I got to basically chip them off. So they're useless after that. Mm-hmm. And then I put my, vene- my finals on and they're like horse teeth terms of thickness so i know immediately that this is not going to work and yet here we are i've gone through all this and now i have to remake the provisionals i've done essentially nothing that day and the biggest and the thing patient's that I, frustrated I and you, oh man 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 the biggest thing i hear from you is this frustration the mm. the hardest thing the hardest thing that a lab tech, technician has to do is to achieve what you're trying to do yeah and 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 which is a minimal, minimal thickness Emax veneer, okay, lithium disilicate that has been hand thinned after it's been milled or pressed, okay? Now, there's no better margin out there than a pressed margin, okay? Yep. I, I, I'm just yet, I mean, I've seen some milled margins that are pretty daggone amazing. Right. But I'm They're telling you like right pressed. now that right. when you press Emax, it's amazing. Now, you one would say... And, and we have to make sure that your margins are really good. But the hardest thing that, John, you're trying to ask is the hardest thing that they're trying to do, which is thin. Right. So it takes highly skilled people to be able to achieve what you're trying to do. Well, so or, what you're, you, what or you, you just s- move 
or you just move away from Emacs and you just go, I'm going to use Feldspathic. You're going to use Feldspathic. But the disadvantage of Feldspathic, what you're saying is, what you're saying is you're going to accept some things here. Yeah, lower okay? strength. Lower strength and the difficulty of fabrication. It's even harder. Oh, yeah, no question. No question is because this and, and is I, the thing. Tell me. It's a lost Because you got art. Brad, the dental lab guy, to make you some Feldspathic veneers. Absolutely, I did. Okay. He And he was like, he was like, and we should get him on to talk about it. We should. I, I wrote on the lab slip. I, I said, couldn't believe it, man. When you told me, I was like, are you serious? You well, talking? I mean, he had to know it was coming because I have to be, and, and, and all love to Brad, but I had to send back a couple of sets of veneers because they were just too thick. They were just, and they were Emacs, and the tech had a hard time. It wasn't Brad, Brad wasn't the tech, but a tech had a hard time thinning out the Emacs. And so I sent them back and I said, do not send these back to me unless the caliper reads the same on my provisional model as it does on the veneer model, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and they, they got it right, but it took a couple of times of messing with this. So I wrote on the RX form, Brad, I think this is a case for Feldspathic. And I get a call and he's like, you're right, man. He's like, you're right. And you know what? I'm going to have to show my technicians how to do feldspathic. And I said, what? He said, yeah, we don't, we don't do feldspathic anymore in our lab. He said, I used to do hundreds, thousands of feldspathic veneers. But he said, since Emacs and even since Empress, we really haven't done it. And so it's like a lost start So that start tells now. me something is that one, it's a lost start because again, right, it takes a lot of training in the lab to be yeah. able to pull this off. And you got to charge for and, it. And this, this is why they struggle. This is why lab technicians struggle with thinning Emacs is because they're not used to doing Feldspathic, which requires a lot of thinning and hand work. Absolutely. It's very fine work. It's yep. very fine. It's hard, don't, hard, hard. I'm going to say it again. Don't ask. Don't ask for a hundred dollar veneer and expect yes. to get amazingness. Yes, if you are, I want to. I, I want to give a lot of credit because we're kind of almost making it sound like we're down on the lab here. No, no, we're we not. We get it, man. Like they're under tremendous pressure. And even at a even at a couple hundred dollar, you know, name your price of a, yeah. of a good a good lab putting together a quality product. You know, that's those that's veneers from Brad, the dental lab guy. I guarantee you, we're not. A hundred. They weren't a hundred and fifty. Uh, no, no, <laughs> and no, they were not. And and I didn't expect them to be. But, but, but the but thing is, you're you going to pay. Back, in my opinion, you you're going to pay three to five to six hundred dollars, depending on who you work with, per unit mm -hmm. for good feldspathic veneers. Now you can so, get you can be on the lower end of that, I think, and still have good good quality. So but if you want people, that, it's a lot of money. A lot of people are doing these hybrid style prosthetics today in every facet to achieve better aesthetics. So when we say hybrid, we're saying they're using a base material like lithium disilicate, which is Emacs, or they're using zirconia as a base material for strength, yep. something that's strong, and then they do a cutback. Right. Literally hand cut it back and then hand layer feldspathic. Now what John is saying, if you... If you're new to this, kind of back up here, just a little nuts and bolts stuff. Feldspathic is basically the same ceramics we've been using for decades. Decades yep. in dentistry. It's like yep. PFM. Right. Right? So it's not a bad material. No. It's that it is very <clears throat> technique sensitive and the art of hand stacking and hand layering ceramics you know why it's gone by the wayside? Because Brad, the dental lab guy, will tell you that everybody wants monolithic restorations today, and they want them to be milled, right? The cold or they just craze. want monolithic because right. of strength. I mean, that's the thing in the end. Well, yeah, give it something stronger, harder, whatever. But, John, how did those look whenever you cemented them? Oh, I mean, they're amazing because amazing. feldspathic gives you the ability to control literally everything. You know, color, with Emacs, color control. With Emacs, yeah, if Emacs, for instance, if you press Emacs, you mill, I don't care what you do, you are going to have a uniform color. You have to, because it's an ingot of right. one, one color. Yeah. Right, but with Feldspathic, it's, li it's literally liquid and powder, and you can say, I want opacity here, 
I want translucency here. And you can dot. You can make lines of opacity. You can make, so you have complete control of, okay, let's say not your, your prep has a dark spot just in the cervical one third that's black. Well, you can put opaque, completely opaque porcelain right there, but then the rest can be totally translucent. So, so they look amazing. This. They look amazing. Are you done with Emacs? Here's where, here's where I'm at now. I have changed. I have changed from where I was really trying. I, was, I feel like I was trying to take <clears throat> uh, uh, Emacs is like a square peg in a round hole for me. I was trying <clears throat> to take that Emacs and take the things I liked about it, the strength and the translucency, and bang it into the shape that I wanted, which was my prep design. And what I've realized is I can do that when I'm going to have an aggressive enough prep that I can do 0 0.6, 0 0.7 types of restorations. But if I'm trying to get below 0.5, that's about where I'm at right now, Wes. So when I look at my reduction burr, I've got a burr that I know what the dimension is at the, ap at the apical at the tip, uh, or at the tip of the burr, and I know that half the tip of that burr is 0.5. So when I'm doing my reduction, if I can keep my, my reduction at 0.5 and below, I'm doing feldspathic. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that because, not because you can't do Emacs to that, because you can but it's so hard for the lab to do that consistently. And I think if you start with feldspathic, so you're saying to the lab, I'm willing to pay for a higher priced material, they're going to take the time because you have specified that to them. Now, so the question is, Wait, I, how I, many, I, <laughs> what? I just, here's the thing. All right, what you're saying, <laughs> because I think, I think I'm, I'm waiting for the day for, Whenever your cases lose vertical dimension, yeah, right, and your patient picks up a crossover, yep, and rather than wearing the edge of the lithium disilicate down naturally, mm -hmm. they break the feldspathic. Yeah, right. Well, because you know, I, you say that I just haven't, and knock on wood, but back when I started off before Emacs was out. I did a fair number of feldspathic cases, not hundreds and hundreds, but I probably did, I don't know, 20, 25 cases with feldspathic, like, you know, 7 to 10, 6 to 11 for my first, I don't know, five, six, seven years. I, and of course, you don't do a lot of veneers when you first get out of school, but after I'd been doing it maybe three, four, five years, I took some good courses. I went to Bertolotti's course. I went to Ed McLaren's courses. And at that time, it was all feldspathic or Empress. And... I'm not saying I've never had any fractures, but man, it, I, I'm a firm believer that feldspathic is good enough. I mean, if PFM was good enough. What kind of size wedge reduction are you doing? Well, you, you got to have 1.5 minimum. But if, if P, I want to say this though, if PFM was good enough, right, I mean, it's the same darn thing, man. It's it's low fusing feldspathic porcelain on it's the edges of our PFMs. PFM. Well, I shouldn't say better. Well, the I mean, bond, the, the, the bond the to enamel and the bond to opaque <clears throat> right. is pretty daggone But I'm good. saying, ulti if we're talking ultimate strength of the material, it should be equivalent to PFM. And we use PFM think, for you know, a long here's time, the thing, man. Is the masking ability of Emacs. I, here's my, my conundrum is that right now, when the best Emacs that I get mm -hmm. is when I ask for the HT ingot. And I'm asking yeah. for it no matter what. HT is nice. Because the HT ingot, okay, is the high, that stands for high translucency. And it's, that's the one that's for these minimally invasive full contour restorations, okay? And, and the thing that I guess what you're saying is that if you can't get them to thin them at the margin. You can't get them to thin them, Wes, but you got to send them back twice. And I ain't doing it. Or, or you're saying, I ain't, I ain't prepping a half millimeter at the margin anymore. I'm done doing that. No. Yeah. And you're tired of seeing gingivitis because of uh, biological width. Or just over contour. And over contours. I'm just, I won't, I'm not seeding over. I, you know what? I, I, I will tell you, I seeded a couple of cases that were over contoured. Mm. You know, not, not, not talking grossly. But there's a couple of veneer cases that I seeded back when I was in the midst of all Emacs all the time. That I was like, well, man, I guess it's the best we can get. And it was over contoured. We've all done that. And and I'm not talking it was grossly, but it was not perfect. And I'm like, dang it. 
And I know that if I go in there with a burr, I'm going to maybe take some of the staining or glazing off. So I don't, I'm not going to do that. So I just was like, well. That's another thing is that with Feldspathic, what you just said right there that you can do with Feldspathic, once it's bonded on, Mm -hmm. like let me tell you right now, you can polish that stuff. Oh, yeah. Like none other. You can't polish Emacs. Not really. Like like you can Feld's Path. And I'm always nervous if I try because of the fact there's a lot of superficial staining going well, on. Well, it all goes away. You know, like the so, other day I was I was, you know, polishing Emacs and at yeah. the margin and there goes my stain and it like dag <clears throat> there's the right. ingot. Especially cuz you just if you just delivered a veneer, you know, you can't have that. So, yeah, so it, it's not I'm not saying, so please don't get me wrong, if you're doing Emacs and you have a lab that will thin it to 0.3, because they tell me they can thin it to 0.3. They're mm-hmm. like, we can thin it to 0.3. I'm like, well, then why don't you do it? Because it's hard. Because it's, it's hard. hard, and I know it's hard, and I think that they would have to charge me the same as they charge me for feldspathic, and again, I think our labs just have a hard time, because they know most people either will just deliver it over contoured, or they aren't willing to pay for what it would take for them to do it perfectly, so they just accept it. And I'm just saying, I, I can't, I can't, Wes, send back another Emacs case. I'm sick of it. So yeah. I'm just not doing it anymore. When I, when I get into these minimal prep type of cases now, less than 0.5, I'm going to feldspathic. And that challenges the lab, too, because what labs are doing this all the time? And that you start to it's learn rare. It, that there's only a few. There's only a few out there, guys. There's only a few people, I feel like, that have had this training. Mm-hmm. That have been doing it for years. Somebody like Brad, the dental lab guy, that can just pull it out of his hat because right. he is amazing. I, I bet there's less than a hundred in the country. Oh, I bet there is. I bet there's less than that. I Maybe. bet there's less than that because you know what was interesting? We were at the digital dentistry conference. I don't know how many years ago. A couple yeah. years ago, three yeah, or four years, years ago. Now. And Brad was there with us, and mm-hmm. we were they were talking about like the state of the art in milling and digital, right? And CAD CAM, and they were they were printing glaze is what was cool. And this yeah. guy gets up there, right? Was it that that show where the guy gets up and says, "There was, hey, there was somebody that stood up and asked in the audience, where can I go to learn what you're doing? Mm. <laughs> and he was like, we don't teach classes in the United States yeah, because yeah. no one no really, one will, no, no one will come. come. Yeah. No one will come. They, so, you know, probably, you know, you're going to have to go to Italy, right? Right. Or somewhere Or in there's Germany. a few places in the U.S. I think, you know, there's Very a few. few. But very it's few. very few. You got to go from like to like, yeah, Galip Garel's out of Turkey. You got to go to somebody like well, Willie Geller kind winter, of type of guy. Winter maybe. Labs or something like that. Right. Where Ed you can McLaren, pay a thousand bucks. There's a, right. right. There's a per, few places per that you can learn this, but man, not a lot. <laughs> it's pretty rare. Lot. But I So tell you just again, be aware again, of that, guys. Again, like most of our patients, most of our patients, John, that need veneers have edge wear and they have large composite dentistry because they've been t- chipping their teeth and it's been repaired and repaired and repaired and they've got multiple things going on. Yeah, There's now that's no, a different story. If you've got Emacs. composites... That's Emacs. Yeah. Yeah. That's Emacs, but, but you're doing crowns and a combination crown veneering and so those right. are the cases. Now, this has been interesting because I feel like, it's, I feel like 20 <laughs> years from now, I want to know as vertical changes... Uh huh. Because I want to see crossover in John Rogers' Feldspathic veneers cases. Now, when I say crossover, I'm talking about <laughs> laterals crossing over. I, I, I want. I want to see. I mean, it. I'm a little nervous too. Because even Frank Spear says that's why see, he the left. Thing, early in my career, when I was doing Feldspathic, I was only doing it on these really easy Are you cases. Saying you're better than Frank Spear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm worried about. Is that when I was early in my because career, he, I was only... he was using Procero to try to find a reason not to use right. Feldspathic. I know, I know. He accepted and opacity. Right. He accepted for opacity strength. for strength. Well, and so that's the thing is, early, like I said, early in my career, I was only doing these Feldspathic cases in patients that didn't have any occlusal risk factors that I Are could identify. Are you an identify. old man? So now, <laughs> no, now, now I feel like here's the thing is like I'm now treating a lot more wear cases because I feel like I know how now, which I didn't. But now I'm choosing a material that's weaker. But I think it's the same argument, Wes. It's the same argument about why we don't like the fact that everybody's trying to put full contour zirconia on stuff. Yeah. If you're chipping porcelain, There's it's telling problem. you something is going on. And I, I'm a Listen. believer. Like I feel like I've, I've drank the Kool-Aid from Spear that if you get your occlusion right, things can work There's out. There's no Kool-Aid about that. 
There's no Kool Aid yeah. about that. Listen, I don't care whether you take Paulson, Dawson, Panky, you know, Coice, Spear. If you yeah. learn occlusion, occlusion, <laughs> and you learn why people destroy things in your practice, yeah. like it all makes Materials sense. Materials start to matter less. Mysteri- I'm not saying they don't matter. That's exactly, and you start to choose. The strength doesn't isn't ranking high on the list right. of it's why not you're the number material. one thing anymore. Where can you go to learn this stuff? That's the question, really, we should be asking right now, and that's probably what you're asking. Like, how in the world do you learn the protocols behind what we're talking about here? Because this is 15, 20 years, you know, between John and us, it's 30 years of of just figuring it out Mm -hmm. and being sitting under people that know more than us, that are smarter than us, and we're still learning. Yeah. Um, And, you know, what I like about this show tonight, one— is it makes me think about how I'm positioning teeth whenever I'm talking to my orthodontist based on the current foundation that they have. If they have a tooth that's war, completely off, yep. you know, and they need a crown, then I'm thinking, hmm, maybe we're going to be doing Emacs. If yep. they have a tooth that's wore just on the incisal edge and we're going to be doing veneers and they don't really have any other restorations, it's not a mixed restoration foundation and yep. i think an emacs if they have a dark stump shade <clears throat> where i have to prep to block that out yeah i'm thinking emacs maybe even zirconium with feldspathic facials if i have a patient that has edge wear that i've had an ortho and then i can position those teeth to an extent to where I can do minimally invasive prepping. Not prepless, minimally invasive, so that I can have a nice margin to position my veneer and seat it on and polish it. And I may be considering Feldspathic because, John Rogers, you're making me think. (laughs) Did I sum the show up (laughs) right? I think that's pretty good. John, tell us, I I mentioned something, tell us where to start learning yeah, this material science and how to and how to take it to the next level. So, so where I would start, and this is where I where I uh, I think that there are a few names that you need to have on your list of continuing education and also authors. Mm. So for me, the number one for me, there's two. Well, two people as Pascal Magna mm. and mm. Galip Garel. These are two of the best in the world uh, and have the most experience and research, not just uh, clinical experience, but research experience on what works, not only in the material side, but in the bonding side. And you've got, you know, Manya's got a book out that's been out for, gosh, 10 years. Uh, Gorel's got a little bit newer one. I, I uh, Those are both ones you could start with. I think in the U.S., you know, UCLA has got a really good aesthetic continuum. Uh, Ed McLaren was involved with that for years. Uh, and he they're actually training master dental technicians alongside uh, dentists who are coming in and taking this aesthetic continuum. I think that anybody are they, that's are involved you saying, with that. Are you saying, John, that they're the emulsion, the emulsifier? Oh, my goodness. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Bringing they're it the back. They're the xanthan gum. Wow. They are it all the bacterial exoskeletons. <laughs> That bring it all together. Yeah, I think that if you they st- merge the dentist and the technician together into one emulsion. Oh man, it becomes yeah, a that, very very palatable thing. <laughs> that's perfect. If you really want to go and get good at this, the only thing I mean, I think it's hard. I think you really need to go take hands on courses on prepping. Yeah, I do too. That's hard to find. I see it sometimes. Jason come Smithson up. does teach veneering. Um, yeah, he does yeah. ceramics and composites. He'll tell you that he does. Yeah, he'd use... be a great place to go. I think yeah. you know. Again, UCLA has got this continuum. It's like a two-year yeah. uh, continuum. About I mean, so you can go take these crazy courses, or you can go take some of these that are the more basics. I think just start becoming familiar. That's a good starting point. It's definitely been a challenge to me in my thought process the last couple of years, and and it mm-hmm. continues to evolve. You know, and and I, I'm I'm looking forward to a, you know. There's all these new materials in the pipeline, Wes. They're yep. always coming down the pipeline. You better have and a good curing light. Maybe we'll get light. to a point where we can. Uh, what's that? You better have a good curing light. <laughs> yeah, that's true too. We got to talk I'm about looking that for, because may, I'm, maybe yeah. one day we'll have something that can be as as versatile as feldspathic, as far as the ability to 
change shades and things and it's thin, but it's easier to produce. Maybe our milling technology or even our printing, printing. technology I think it's will be get printing. good enough. I don't think it's going to be milling. Yeah, we'll get good enough that we can print these 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeter That's restorations be, and have it have it look good and handle well. So mm. that's something to look forward to. If you've liked this episode, first of all, give us your feedback. We want to mm. know what you think. We want to know if you liked it. We want to know if this helped you. We want to know if this is you know the worst show you've ever heard. <laughs> so tell us what you think. If it is, and post it. <laughs> Yeah, please post it, good or bad. People have no problem posting posting we like both the things. Trend. We like the yeah. trend. Um, if if you have had experiences with these materials that you want to share, if you want to send uh, pictures of fractured feldspathic so that I don't sleep at night ever uh, and and just freak me out, go right I'm, ahead. I'm calling uh, Frank Spear up right now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you know, connect with us. Give us some love on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, all the socials. And uh, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That's probably the thing that gets us out to the most people, uh, giving us a review there, but also on Facebook. Also, uh, you know, hit us up on, on, like I say, on all the socials and tell us what you think and give us ideas for what you want to hear more about on these shows because we're always looking to do things that we think are going to work for day-to-day -day practice, help you to become a better dentist, help you to take your dentistry to the next level. For Wes, I'm John. This has been another great episode of The Dental Guide.